Well, bona da pao ba kroso kanes yaun. Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our video Sunday service for the churches in the local ministry area of Brotivy. So that's the churches in Cardigan and the surrounding area. This morning, we're coming to you from St. John's Church in Betis, Iran, that beautiful little peaceful village. My name is Christopher Frost. I'm one of the team vicars in this local area. And today in our service, well, we like to keep things really simple for our video service. We have songs, a psalm, a reading from the Bible, some uh, a talk and some prayers. We love to keep it nice and simple for all of you and for ourselves as well. It makes it easy on ourselves. It's so good just to worship the Lord in a formal way sometimes and informal at other times. So we're going to begin with our first song. Please do sing along at home if you like, if your friends and family who are around you can put up with it. It's always good to worship the Lord. Wherever we are and wherever we might be, we worship this morning together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
And now we're going to have our psalm. It's a very short one, Psalm 131. It is a psalm, but it also can be read as a prayer, a prayer for humility, something we'll be looking into in our reading this morning. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. And our reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, A long time ago now, both myself and a number of other people in one particular church were having problems with one particular person, someone who had been there for a very long time, but had developed a habit of sometimes doing very nice things and other times, or most of the time, causing a huge amount of trouble, upset and pain within the congregation. This person seemed to be almost totally fixated on two things, getting their way and being in charge, and heaven help anyone in the world who who got in their way. They had quite viciously attacked the previous vicar behind his back, and had been doing the same to many other people, including the new vicar, and had even said that uh, all decisions made by the vicar should be run by them first, before talking to anyone else. They were desperate to be the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. Their behaviour was well known about and had been tolerated for a long time because their very strong personality kind of intimidated people. And also, they admittedly did a lot of charitable things to help the church and liked to remind people of it often. Eventually, they realised that this new vicar wasn't going to give them what they wanted and and also got spectacularly caught out in their own manipulative behaviour one day. So they left the church without any word of apology continuing to attack almost anyone they could behind their backs. Now, I saw this person at a coffee morning a little while later, and I gently asked why they didn't make amends and apologise to the people they'd hurt, maybe get back involved in the church community. Unsurprisingly, this person had become a bit lonely. And the answer came back quickly. Well, I'm very proud. I'm very, very proud. And I could tell by the way they answered the question that they were indeed so proud that they were deeply proud of, well, being proud. I felt a little prompting and a little boldness from the Holy Spirit at that moment. And so I replied, well, did you know that you can't be a Christian and be proud at the same time? God tells us in the Bible that he actually hates pride. Jesus taught about the danger of pride very often, reminding us that God's forgiveness is not for those who who don't believe they need it. The book of Proverbs warns us of the danger of pride many times. You know, pride goes before destruction. 
And Paul and the other apostles warn us about pride too, reminding us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, the person listened to me saying that, or at least words to that effect, and kind of walked away without saying anything about it. And my memories of that moment, and my reflections on my own weaknesses, serve to remind me just how much pride is the number one enemy of all Christians everywhere. It is the dangerous heart attitude that leads to all kinds of behavior, difficult behavior, bitterness, divisiveness, and even general foolishness. According to Paul and Jesus and pretty much everyone else in the Bible who recorded the teachings of God for us, if you turn your back on pride and discover humility, then actually you've discovered joy, a real deep-seated joy, even a lot of freedom, which is interesting because that's almost the opposite message that the world around us seems to say. Pride is an overconcern with ourselves. It's a predisposition to exalt ourselves, to elevate ourselves above others and even above God himself, to hide our defects, or at least to try and hide them, to almost worship ourselves. And we're all tempted by pride in one way or another and to one degree or another. A heart that's full of pride carries a lot of symptoms with it. Proud people tend to cause a lot of trouble wherever they go. Look at the lives of people around you or even your own life. If there are lots and lots of fallings out with people all the time, lots of strife over little things, lots of feeling un unappreciated and thinking others should be doing better by you all the time, then you probably have a problem with pride because instead of being peacemakers, proud people often have a short fuse and a very quick to anger. They do not like forgiving people and can even become quite merciless when, when someone's hurt or offended them in some way. The pride within us makes us want to bite back as hard as we can and, and never forget it as we, we try and teach people a lesson never to mess with us. We forget how precious the moments have been when others have forgiven us for something. And we think to ourselves, oh, why should I forgive? As if we've never needed the forgiveness of God and of other people. Rather than looking at their own faults, people struggling with pride will do almost anything to deflect and complain about the faults of others. There's an old Indian saying that I really like, that when someone doesn't brush their teeth for three weeks, the only person not to smell it is themselves. Even though their nose is right there, they've gotten used to their problems, and that is pride. When we are trapped in pride, we also find it incredibly difficult to apologize and really take, it in, take into account the things we've done wrong. And when proud people do apologize, it tends to be along the lines of, well, yes, I'm sorry, but quickly followed by an explanation of how the other person is actually the one to blame. It's part and parcel of our common temptation to either refuse to see our own faults and failures or, or to simply be too proud to acknowledge them. Proud people tend to volunteer for things, but then quit them again a little while later, writing long, angry letters of resignation to, to whoever they can about how awful everyone else is and, and how their skills and hard work clearly weren't appreciated. They tend to leave churches quickly too, when they're not given something they want or, or when they realize that particular church isn't perfect enough for them. Instead of wanting to listen and learn from others, proud people are often not very teachable they don't tend to be very interested in listening to God or to the people around them, sometimes getting offended by the mere suggestion that they would need to. They don't listen to sermons, they don't read the Bible, and they don't come to others openly for help or advice. They might ignore God completely, even people who boast about having come to church for a long time. Or when they come across some teaching in the Bible that they don't like, They'll often ignore it or, or say that they don't believe it. And this is the serious trap that many more liberal Christians fall into, picking and choosing what they want to believe, subliminally thinking that they know better than God. People who have a problem with pride can often be very charitable and very generous, but often the reason behind it isn't love, 
It's so that others might see them as being important and indispensable, or, or so that others might owe them a favour, and as a result, they'll tend to subtly boast and remind people of their generosity as often as they can. Proud people love to take the credit for things and often like to talk about their achievements. Some other people who struggle with pride might be listening to what I'm saying right now and thinking, oh gosh, I'm so glad I'm not like those awful proud people. I have achieved humility. Bad news, there is no achieving humility because as soon as you think you have, that is pride. And before you think that I'm being pretty proud and judgmental myself right now, well, I'd better say that virtually everything I have just mentioned are things that I have done myself in the past and my own struggles with pride. That's how I know about them so well. Because of all these problems and many more, people who are very proud of themselves have a tendency actually to live quite unhappy lives. They make, bad, they make bad decisions because they don't listen to advice from other people. They burn bridges in their relationships quickly when there's a problem, causing them to miss out on valuable friendships over small, often small disagreements or past hurts that, that they just don't want to forgive. Proud people get into such a mess and as a result they miss out on so much joy and so much of life's beautiful simplicity. How can we find humility then? How can we cultivate it? How can we resist that, that pull and power of pride in our own lives whenever it rears its ugly head, as it does so often? Well, the good news is that Paul tells us how to do just that in our passage today. He is telling the church in Philippi to find joy in their humility. Firstly, he starts by urging them from verse 2 to make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Paul here is saying, no matter how much you value yourself, and we tend to value ourselves a lot, value others even higher. Having a heart to do that will help to smash through your pride, because pride comes out of valuing yourself above others, above God, above anything and everything else. In all your interactions and thoughts about others, it can be so arresting and powerful just to pause and think to yourself, Am I valuing that person more than myself? Do they have more value to me? Do I need to calm down about myself today? Maybe take myself less seriously? Maybe apologize to a few people so that we can enjoy some more peace? Genuinely deciding to do that will stop you in your tracks. Seeing others as being made in the image of God, even difficult people, and seeing them as being worthy to be served makes all the difference. And Paul seems to suggest that doing so will also help to cut through quarrelling and arguing in your life and in the life of the church and help you to forgive. But thankfully, Paul doesn't just tell us to do all of this. He offers us some inspiration too. He goes on in verses 6 to 11 to write down a beautiful hymn for us all about the divine power and infinite majesty of Jesus Christ, his glory and his perfection, and how no mere mortal human being could ever even dream of coming close to who Jesus is. And you can read it again for yourself if you like, verses 6 to 11. And many scholars today actually think that this was a hymn or perhaps a creed that the very earliest Christians wrote long before Paul even wrote this letter. And Paul's aim in giving that to us is to stir us up, stir up our imagination and inspire us by the humility of Jesus Christ. If Jesus, the King of the universe, the Son of God, the man who is God, the perfect being, the judge of the nations, the miracle worker, if Jesus could leave his home in glory in heaven, to come and humbly serve us, 
be misunderstood and hated by us, even killed by us, if he could find the humility to do that, then surely we can do it too, with a little help from the Holy Spirit. None of us come close to the beauty or perfection of Jesus, and none of us have been wronged or hated or mistreated as much and as cruelly as he was. And yet, he put himself through it all. He chose to come and do it. Why? For one reason alone. He loves you. Be inspired today by the humility of Jesus Christ. People who have managed to recognise the danger of their own pride and to choose to pursue humility find it easier to genuinely love others, easier to forgive, much, much easier to apologise, easier to genuinely want the best for others and to serve them. They find it easier to put their ego aside and listen to God and seek him and come to him, come to the Holy Spirit and learn from him easier to read the Bible as they realise that God has wisdom for them that they can't find anywhere else. They find it easier, humble people find it easier to quit judging everyone else in the back of their minds all day long, like I'm tempted to do, and just focus on their own problems. And as a result, they become better, more peaceful people, inspirational people who can handle conflict and disagreement without running away and quitting and with a deep sense of peace about them. Humility changes everything. It brings great peace and with great peace comes great joy. And it all starts with us being focused on and inspired by the humility of Jesus Christ. Amen. May we pray. Father God, thank you so much for what you offer to us this morning, which is so different from that which the world offers us, a chance and a way in the power of your Holy Spirit and under the inspiration of Jesus to walk away from our pride, to be a broken people for you, to be drawn to you irresistibly in humility. Help us, Father, to let go of any pride within our hearts, any judgmentalism towards others, any thinking of ourselves as greater or more valuable than those around us. Help us to have hearts of true, genuine love, true, genuine hope for the people around us. Help us to live for them. And I'm praying for myself as much as for anyone else here. Father, fill us with great humility. Break us, mold us, change us. Take away our independent spirit and help us to be dependent on you, to be listening to others. Break us down, Father, because we know that when we become humble, finally, that your kingdom will come in our churches and we will see peace and much less quarreling and strife, wherever that might be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, this week, something that's been brought sharply into focus are tensions between East and West, and that's something else we pray for. We pray for an easement of tensions between Russia and Ukraine and, and countries of the West. We want to pray that calm heads will prevail in that difficult, difficult situation. Whatever is going on behind it, Father, we pray that it would stop and that the tensions would cease by your mighty hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, this morning we pray for those in authority over us, spiritual and otherwise. We pray for our governments in Westminster and Cardiff. We pray for clarity and openness and integrity in our governments, no matter what might be going on. And we pray for our Bishop Joanna and our Archdeacon Eileen and our Emir Dean John, especially as he and his new wife Catherine get used to married life. We thank you for bringing them together. And we ask that you would bless those in spiritual authority over us and help them to lead us with integrity, with hope and with great wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shall we take a moment of silence now to pray for anyone we know to be in need, to be sick or unwell, to be lonely, or to be far away from God. Lord.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we draw our prayers to a close by saying the Lord's Prayer, firstly in Welsh and then in English. Ein tad, ar hon atina nevoith, sanctadia de enu, dela de denas, gunella de eulis, megas in a nev, vetlia la dial heaved, dolo ini had the uin bala benethiol, amadai ini ein deledion, vel amadon ninoi in deledwea, akna kalwani i provedigaith, eith a gwaled ni flag drug. Canis he do tiel denas, al gachli, al gagoniant, and oisoi soith. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory ever and ever. Amen. I bendeth to you hotlachliog, a tad amab alispid glan, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and those who you love, now and for evermore. Amen. Bye.